dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. When all things are said and done, the goal of leadership ought to be simple. Thomas Aquinas provides us with a wonderful summary in chapter 16 of his work, On the King. He gives us a final goal, three things. By focusing on these three things, we can find the direction we need as we apply leadership to our home, our business, and our world. Hey, everybody, thanks so much for coming and choosing to improve your leadership. Let's begin today with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. John, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. I want to first of all just welcome you with, who are not finding themselves working in a nonprofit or don't work for the church, I want you to realize that you're here not in order to be indoctrinated in an impossible task for your leadership, but actually you're going to hear a message today that's going to really help you to live exactly where you are now and as secular leaders or leaders of secular businesses. And it's going to help you to do that in a great way. For, there's like a caricature of Catholicism that somehow, you know, Catholicism or, or the Bible or faith will smother an otherwise normal life, right? <laughs> we all have this kind of like fear deep down inside that if I really become Catholic and I become Catholic in the workplace and I let my Catholicism shine out there in the workplace, that somehow I'm going to impose that upon other people or I'm going to be looked at upon as a religious fanatic or if, especially if you're in a leadership position in a business that you're going to get complaints against you and that that's going to cost you your job. And, and so we, we end up with this weird phenomenon, which is completely anti-Catholic, by the way, which is to say that my spirituality has nothing to do with my work. And we leave spirituality kind of like in the realm of a family and we leave it out of our workplace. But the problem is that we spend eight to 10 hours a day at work. And if my spirituality can't be brought into the workplace, I'm spending a third of my life outside of spirituality, outside of my faith. And when something tells us that that's just not quite right, right? Because that's not why Jesus came and died so that a third of our life would remain outside of, of, of his fruitfulness and the power of his spirit. No, what happens though if I, I mean, but the question is how can I do that? How can I bring the power of the resurrection and the fruitfulness of the Holy Spirit to in, in a world that doesn't allow him to be known? And this is something I really, I've got good news for you. And that's that the, the Catholic Church's foremost thinker, St. Thomas Aquinas, all right, an amazing, the common doctor, the doctor of the church who's able to teach us about everything, the doctor communis, as they call him in Latin. Actually, instead of putting this burden upon you of making you feel guilty for living in a secular world, actually shows us that God has a call for you right there. You don't have to quit your position as a sales executive for a major Fortune 500 company, for example, and just be and say or say that it's pointless 
just because of your faith. On the contrary, Aquinas is like, that's where we need you because you have a mission and a purpose to bear there for people in a world outside of faith that can dispose them and actually prepare them for, the, for the, when God comes to knock at the doors of their hearts. And, and your role, might, and you might prefer to have a role which is directly evangelizing or directly faith-filled. I mean, that's the great you know, privilege of those who do work for the church or work for evangelism. Like myself, I'm a Catholic priest. But at the same time, he says that that's not the only spot. As a matter of fact, even if you're not able to live there, you have a very important role that's even at one of evangelization of preparing people with everything that's necessary so that when they hear the word of God proclaimed to them, they see it as consonant with who they are already. And that is the leadership he calls a leadership of virtue. And I want to talk to you about that because those, he lays out three things that a leader needs to do and he, all of them focus in primarily on this cultivation of a life of virtue. What does this mean? Let's take a look right now. He's talking here, we're reading in chapter 16 of his book, De Regno, On the King, which is a letter that he wrote to the king of Cyprus all about being a king. And it's so applicable for us today who are kings in little ways by the, the, the places that we, where we lead and where we exert our influence for Christ. Aquinas puts it really beautifully in paragraph 115, chapter 16. He says, anyone on whom it devolves to do something which is ordained to another thing as to its end is bound to see that his work is suitable to that end. Thus, for example, the armorer so fashions the sword that it is suitable for fighting and the builder should so lay out the house that it is suitable for habitation. Therefore, since the beatitude of heaven is the end of that virtuous life which we live at present, it pertains to the king's office to promote the good life of the multitude in such a way as to make it suitable for the attainment of heavenly happiness. That is to say, he should command those things which lead to the happiness of heaven as far as possible by forbidding the contrary. All right. So whenever you read Aquinas, it can be just a little bit overwhelming because it uses a different vocabulary than what we're used to. And he has just has such an amazing logic and logical format that we're not used to that gripping our minds. But it needs to. And what he just said in this paragraph is so important. He says that there's two functions, right? There's the priestly function of uniting souls to God directly and there's the kingly function, which is to dispose or prepare for that union with God by the life of virtue. Now you could say, why virtue? Where does that come into it? And he says it's because anytime human beings live together in a community, it's for the sake of something. And we come together in a community for the sake of living a good life. There's a perfection of life that comes in a community that can't be found elsewhere. That perfection of a life in a community is the life that is good, a good life being found and being lived out there in a community. And the king is the one who's in charge of that community. And therefore his goal or focus needs to be that the life lived there be good. Not necessarily that it be holy or that it be Christian, but that it be good. That serves the work of the priest, whose job it is, of course, to make it Christian and to unite it to God directly. It serves it because only a good life is capable of bearing the name Christian. Any other life but a good life, a virtuous life, is a, is a life that you couldn't say is Christian. It'd be actually a life that would detriment, be a detriment to the name of Christian. And so if we want to unite this in ourselves and we're like, well, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. I love my Catholic faith. I want to live that out, right? Well, you could say, well, I, I can't do that in a secular world. And Thomas would meet you and say, no, on the contrary, 
You certainly can and indeed you must. By focusing your efforts on doing what's necessary in that secular world to make that secular world befit the high calling which is found in Christ Jesus and that work of making it fitting for grace is the work of leading it in virtue. This is the place that I have in my leadership at home, in the workplace, and in society to make sure that everywhere where I rule, I lift people up into a level of excellence that makes it easy for them to follow the Lord of Lords on his pathway of royal perfection. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. So in chapter 16 of De Regno, our On the King, Aquinas goes even further. He says, you know, you got to focus yourself here on the life of virtue. Okay? Virtue is where everything takes place in terms of secular leadership, societal leadership, because you, you can't give grace. That's something only God can do. And this is an important thing because a lot of times as parents, we really struggle. We, we say, why aren't our kids believing? Why aren't they following Christ? We want them to, but they're not, right? And Aquinas actually can help us with that. He says, you know, it's not that you, you can only do what is human. The bestowal of grace comes from God. And God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we're going to have confidence that he's going to bestow that grace. My job as a parent is not to give that grace. That's up to God but to give access to that grace by participation in the sacraments, by Catholic education, by all those things, but also to prepare that soul for grace by whetting their appetite for higher things. The worst thing that I can do, therefore, as a parent, <laughs> the worst thing I can do is spoil my kids by too much materialism. And no, I'm not condemning you for having a lot of things, for being successful. No, I'm not condemning you for being generous with your kids and making sure that they look great and have these things. I'm not, I'm not making a condemnation here of that. But what I am doing is offering each of you a little bit of a different perspective to say, if you give them a lot of things, you have to redouble your efforts as a parent to give them even more soul and spirit so that they can bear the weight of all of that material success and not let it overcome or overwhelm them. If we're not careful, our outside will replace our inside. And when we give a lot to our children, thinking that we're thereby giving them advantage, we're actually oftentimes putting them at a disadvantage because we haven't taught them that they have to couple outer success with inner character or else the weight of the gold and the riches, so to speak, will break their little camel's back and they'll become a slave to the things of this world and a slave to materialism instead of the free people that you want them to be. Well, how do you do that? You do that by teaching them what's called the life of virtue. And the life of virtue is that, that life inside of us that allows us to go beyond what's material and taste excellence. In other words, when you live a life that's virtuous, the very act that you do, being good, is satisfying in itself. A life of virtue says, you know what? I've got a great marriage and I've got great kids. I'm happy in my life. That's a virtuous person. The life of virtue says, you know what? I've had a nice meal. That's enough. I could overindulge, but I'm not going to because if I have too much, it'll actually ruin it. The life of virtue says chastity is a beautiful thing because in chastity, I don't spoil my love. I communicate it, right? I can spoil my love by making it quite simply overly physical. And I can reduce it from what it really is, 
which is an expression of my heart and my soul. See, all these different aspects, what's necessary is a type of discipline that, that keeps us from surrendering ourselves to pleasure, the physical pleasures of sensible things, so that we can embrace the spiritual pleasures of spiritual things. Things like communion with another person. Things like the appreciation of beauty. Things like a, an act that is well poised and well executed. The, when a leader needs to be schooled in those more excellent things so as to elevate all those around her to a level of excellence that they desire. Otherwise, we're not leading. If we're not leading in character, folks, we're not leading in depth. And most of us here are leaders who are of power. But that doesn't mean you have authority. You have power because you can execute material things on the outside. You will have authority when you can impact the people around you on the inside. And that authority comes when you've elevated yourself beyond material gain only or material pleasure only. And you've coupled material gain or material pleasure with a, an excellence of soul and character that gives it meaning because it allows it to attain its purpose. This is why Aquinas talks about this saying there's a threefold goal of every leader. The three things that you need to do as a leader. And it's amazing because he doesn't say you need as a leader to give them faith. No. Or you as a leader need to witness to them to Jesus Christ. No, 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 not overtly. He doesn't say that. Here's what he says. He says, the first goal of a leader is to establish a virtual life in the multitude subject to him. Second, to preserve that virtuous life once it is established. And third, having preserved it, to promote its greater perfection. First is established. Second is to preserve. Third is to promote. So all of it's focused on that singular goal, though, which is called the virtuous life. And so how do we do this? He says, well, to, to establish a virtuous life, you need to have three things. First, you have to have what he calls the unity of peace being established. So what that means for St. Thomas Aquinas is that everyone be there. You have the people, in other words, in their right places. You can't do anything until a team is actually present. So this reminds me of the five stages that a team will go through. Any group of people will go through these five stages and all groups of people, whenever they're put in a common situation or with a common mission, will have these five stages. You can write these down. These are really good. The first stage is called forming. So the forming is when everybody is present and they realize that they have a common bond, a common mission. So forming would be at a staff meeting when you make sure everyone's there and then you introduce the new staff members to the team and you explain their role on the team and everyone else's role on the team and you do a little check-in so everybody knows where everybody's situated. That's called forming a community. The second is called storming, <laughs> which means as soon as everyone's there and you start to endeavor to do whatever it is that you need to do as a team, you'll encounter stress and stressors. That storming stage is where collisions happen. Conflict arises. I think we should go this way. I think we should go this way. This person didn't ask me to do this, but this person did it in their stead. People are out of place, etc. That leads us to the most important stage in forming a community, which is called norming. So the norming stage is where as a group, you sit down and you say, here's how we're going to deal with that conflict. So we need to establish some ground rules. We need to speak about who's doing what. We need to reorganize what's happening so that we can be efficient. You go from forming to storming to norming. The fourth stage is performing. And this is what Thomas would refer to as the unity of peace. When you have your place, people there, and they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, 
life is good. The fifth stage is transforming, and that's where that cultural matrix of performing goes to higher things and broader things, okay? It makes impact in the culture around them. So those five stages of the team, you can actually find those same five stages listed off here by St. Thomas Aquinas in his own way. The very first thing you need to do as a leader is put the people on the bus to form that community, to get them in the right spot so that they're actually performing. And the second is, is that then you push that performing multitude that you found in a unity of peace to a higher level. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. If I'm called to lead people, I need to keep in mind what it's all about. What is the goal of my leadership? For Aquinas, he's like, all right, the goal of your leadership is, of course, that everyone goes to eternal life. I mean, you're a Christian leader, right? So you're supposed to, but you can't focus on that if that's not been given to you. If you're not a priest, if you're not, you know, a bestower of grace, there's not much you can do there to bring towards eternal life directly. But what you can do is dispose and prepare the people in your group to be the most excellent that they can possibly be so that when God comes knocking, they follow because they're used to his language, right? And so what do you do, therefore? He says you got to form a team and you got to form your multitude to be virtuous. The first thing, put them in their places and get them to create that team spirit. You form the team, you let them storm, you create norms, right, so that they perform and can transform. Five stages of, of teamwork. Right? But the second thing, once you have that unity of peace and their team is up and they're performing, is that you have to preserve it. This is, you're always looking down the pike as a leader, right? It's, it's, it's sometimes we could say, can I ever just get a break? When am I done? You know, it's like, well... If you're leading that team, you've got to think of everything. And that means its sustainability is, is, this, is just as important as the unity of peace. If you have the unity of peace up, but you don't have the protections in place to preserve it or keep it from, from the position, the people on the team that are doing it harm or making sure that it has the material support that it needs to continue, well, then it's going to fail and you can't look forward it to fail. So you need to take the second step which is to support what you have already formed, to keep it going. Here's what Aquinas says. There are three things that prevent the performance of the public good. One of these arises from nature. The good of the multitude should not be established for one time only. It should be, in a sense, perpetual. Men, on the other hand, cannot abide forever because they are mortal. Even while they are alive, they do not always preserve the same vigor for the life of man is subject to many changes and thus a man is not equally suited to the performance of the same duties throughout the whole span of his life. A second impediment to the preservation of the public good, which comes from within, consists in the perversity of the wills of men in as much as they are either too lazy to perform what the common wheel demands or still further, they are harmful to the peace of the multitude because by transgressing justice, they disturb the peace of others. The third hindrance to the preservation of the common weal comes from without, namely, when peace is destroyed through the attacks of the enemy. As it sometimes happened, the kingdom or city is completely blotted out. All right. So it says your goal as a leader then is to preserve what you have created. How do you preserve it? He's like, there are three ways that it's going to be go down. Number one is just the people are going to, there's going to be turnover. People leave, people get tired. People are not always at their, at their, at t that they're the name number one spot in their game. So of course we think right away of how I can keep my people fresh, how I can keep them motivated, how I can help them to advance. That's actually preserving your own and sustaining your own endeavor. It's not just a matter of rewards. This is a matter of survival. If you don't replace goods that are taken away, from your family, from your, you know, you, the, the, eventually it will erode. Second, you've got to be willing to get rid of bad agents. 
when you've got a C player in there, it's not just that their opinions and emotions are at stake. It's the opinions of everyone else. And you, you, sometimes you've got to be able to be like a good gardener and weed. <laughs> the third is the attacks that come from the outside. It's so amazing that so often we only look at the outer threats as our role as a leader. And we forget that if the culture erodes from the inside, the entire endeavor is at jeopardy. My role is not just to found the unity of peace, but to preserve it and to preserve it against atrophy, against corruption, and against outward attacks. The third thing that I got to do is promote it, right? He says really beautifully, the king should be solicitous for its improvement. He performs this duty when he corrects what is out of order and supplies what is lacking. And, and then when he, uh, like the apostle, exhorts the faithful to be zealous for the better gifts. You lead from the front, my friends. The beautiful thing about your leadership and you keeping in mind it's the foundation and peace, the preservation of that unity against attack, but even more to make your leadership dynamic. You lead from the front by your own pursuit of excellence. The more passionate you are for the higher things, the more passionate your people will be for the better life. And this is what it got, why God has put you where he's put you. It's to allow by your thirst for excellence to open the hearts of those who are underneath you, to thirst with you, and to strive for the higher things themselves. And that's where their efforts meet the, the mercy of God and the great things of Christ can indeed take place. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.